Welcome, one and all, to my new series on the occult. In this series, we will dive deep into the occulted layers of the human psyche, culture, and nature, unearthing secrets that have been withheld from us by the dark occultists that reign over this world. In each episode, I will attempt to unravel the complex tapestry woven by ancient myths, arcane symbols, and timeless esoteric teachings. From the cryptic rituals of the mystery schools to the profound philosophies that have guided seekers of truth throughout all ages. We'll investigate how these occult elements manifest at all levels of reality and how they relate to universal problems and solutions that we are currently facing as a species. Through this lens, we will reveal the subtle interplay between things like popular culture, geopolitics, and age-old traditions uncovering the timeless narratives that continue to captivate the human psyche. As we navigate through history and mythology, philosophy and symbolism, a clear picture will be unveiled about the nature of our world and ourselves. Whether you are a seasoned scholar of the occult or just a curious explorer eager to delve into the mysteries of existence, there will be illumination for all viewers at any level of consciousness. The scope of this work is enormous in scale and a wide variety of seemingly unrelated topics will be covered. Each of these topics are large enough in scope that they should be considered separate studies unto themselves. The intention is not to cover every little minute nuance and detail of each topic, but to present an overall tapestry from which a larger picture may emerge in the minds of viewers and listeners. Rather than absorbing this information from a purely analytical point of view, I suggest that one would benefit much more by simply going over the material with an open mind and an open heart. Of course, keeping healthy skepticism in the forefront, but try to feel the information that is being presented from an intuitive point of view. Ask yourself if what you are hearing resonates with your inner knowing. None of the information contained within this series are my own. It is simply information about the world in which we live in that I have come to understand and I feel others could benefit by also understanding. I am also not asking anyone to believe anything that is contained in this series. As a matter of fact, the absolute worst thing that could happen is that you leave here believing anything that you have heard. You must seek to verify it through your own research and gnosis in your own experiences. The whole purpose of this body of work is to encourage others to seek the knowledge that can lead them to a better understanding of themselves and our world. I also would ask you to consider that regardless of the circumstance or events that have led you to my channel, it is not an accident that you have found it. We are led to certain experiences for a reason. Thank you very much for joining me on this adventure into the profound mysteries of the occult. So as an initiator and as a caveat or a cautionary warning to those who are interested in deeper learning, I bring this poem to you by Alexander Pope. A little learning is a dangerous thing. Drink deep or taste not the Pyrian spring. Their shallow droughts intoxicate the brain and drinking largely sobers us again. Fired at first sight with what the muse imparts in fearless youth we tempt the heights of arts. 
while from the bounded level of our mind short views we take, nor but more advanced, behold with strange surprise, new distant scenes of endless science rise. So pleased at first the towering Alps we try, mount over the vales and seem to tread the sky. The eternal snows appear, and the first clouds and mountains seem the last. But those attained, we tremble to survey the growing labors of the lengthened way. The increasing prospects tire our wandering eyes. Hills peep over hills, and Alps on Alps arise. The Pyrian Spring refers to the fount of knowledge and inspiration in Greek mythology. Traditionally associated with the Muses, the goddesses of the arts and sciences. The phrase drinking from the Pyrian spring implies seeking inspiration and wisdom, particularly in matters of creativity and learning and the esoteric knowledge coming from the Egyptian sciences. So the poem could be interpreted as a piece of poetry that draws its inspiration and depth from the mystical source of knowledge and creativity. The spring itself represents not only the unconscious realm, but also the fluids of eternal life, for it is connected to the Arthurian legend, which we will be speaking on in great depth in later episodes. It represents fluidity in the sacred feminine principle, but also represents the spiritual realm in the knowledge which is passed down throughout the ages like a spring or a river which seemingly flows in and out of time and existence. In many ways, synchronistically, it is a spring, meaning that it coils like a serpent. It is a wave sign and it flows like music. The spring also will spring you forward into higher states of consciousness. And that is the intention behind all of this work which I have aggregated for this series. So to all those who truly have the care and the drive to drink deep from the spring, I congratulate you for you are on a journey of self-awareness and the expansion of consciousness like no other. So in this series, we are going to be chronologically moving through the occult sciences. It is going to be a humongous tapestry of rich information. And to start us out with, I would like to explain what initiation actually is. Initiation into the occult mysteries is a process by which individuals are introduced to the hidden esoteric and spiritual knowledge and practices. Initiation is a symbolic and transformative experience designed to impart profound insights, spiritual growth, and an understanding of the mysteries of the occult sciences. Initiation is seen as a rite of passage. It is known to awaken higher potential, expand consciousness, and catalyze spiritual growth. This includes teachings on symbolism, ritual, divinations, alchemy, astrology, astrotheology, astronomy, philosophy, and other esoteric subjects. There are many requirements, but one of which is the knowledge of a higher power. The reason why I say that a higher power is required is because all ancient totemic societies and indigenous cultures for you to be initiated into the higher mysteries of the occult and esoteric teachings you had to at least at the level the low level of belief have some semblance of respect for a higher power this means whether it was direct gnosis or just a belief you had to acknowledge some form of higher force in the universe. With initiation comes ceremonies, typically involving elaborate rituals that are designed to convey esoteric meanings and teachings in a theatrical way. These rituals include the use of sacred symbols, ceremonial tools or implements, and specific incantations. In many occult traditions, initiates are guided by mentors or experienced practitioners who serve as teachers and guides, as peers to the initiate. And as we progress through this series, we are going to see the vast interconnected network of esoteric teachings that at its roots is based in the Egyptian culture and Egyptian sciences that bring us all together and teaches us 
about collective consciousness and the connection to each other. We will see that in these ceremonies, there is an intimate and integral part of being part of the whole, but without losing the individual. In the mystery schools and clandestine societies, the initiation process is regarded as a sacred act. It is a required passage through the second birth, and those who have achieved this elevated state are known as the twice-born. Only those who successfully complete the rigorous journey and attain the second awakening could truly fathom the mysteries of the self within its operational realm. Initiation is not the end of the journey, but the beginning. Initiates are expected to continue their study and practice within the occult mysteries, deepening their understanding and attaining mastery of principles. The initiates are also set on a specific goal to help evolve consciousness and the species by understanding the occult and applying them and living in harmony with the universal laws. Occult organizations or secret societies and traditions have a cooperative hierarchical structure with different levels or degrees of initiation. As initiates progress through these levels, they gain access to deeper knowledge and teachings. Historically, mystery schools and secret societies have been the custodians of occult knowledge and initiation ceremonies. These schools often maintain strict confidentiality about their teachings and practices to ensure its safe handling and for self-preservation or for a power differential between those who hold the occult sciences and those who do not. One does not need to join any group, society, or lodge to attain the second birth. It has to be personally earned through a demanding and painstaking due diligence of refining one's character and conduct. It's essential to grasp that genuine transformation requires a correct understanding of objective morality and the occult natural order or natural laws. This truth, far from being a novel revelation, has perpetually existed and it stands as an ever-present prerequisite for expanding one's consciousness horizons and to bring about a better world and condition. The occultist, who is the founder of Thelema, Alistair Crowley, which we will be talking about in depth in a future episode, says, The second birth is a spiritual rebirth, a shedding of the old self and a becoming of the true self in tune with the cosmic forces of the universe. This second birth is very similar and esoterically related to the serpent. As the snake sheds its skin, it has a new beginning, a new rebirth, which also has connections to the phoenix, which burns itself into ashes and then is reborn out of those ashes into a new bright being of cosmic force. Obviously, there is a lot of controversy with Aleister Crowley, and we will be getting into that. But his statement stands true for the process of the second birth. It is all about aligning oneself with the cosmic forces of the universe and gaining a true self-actualization, which means that we have to do our inner work
initiation is far more than just joining with some secret group or society to be appointed certain levels or to have access to deeper mysteries. Although in totemic societies, this hierarchical structure is very crucial for rites of passage and the correct responsibility of handling such information as we develop our consciousness. But one does not need to swear allegiance to any group to be initiated, nor do they have to swear allegiance to have the second birth. Initiation takes part as a process of self-actualization, becoming more aware of who we are and our inner workings in contrast and comparison to the external world and the realm in which we operate in. The second birth is not the end. It is not the gold. It is simply a stepping stone for our evolution is a fractal process. And as we progress, we will see that we are ourselves symbols that constantly unfold with every experience gained. A new awareness comes for the initiate. Esoteric knowledge is crucial. So we must define what we mean by esoteric in comparison to exoteric knowledge. Exoteric knowledge literally means public outer or common it means readily available to the general public and is not limited to a specific group or initiates exoteric teachings are usually surface level understanding presented in a simple manner making them accessible to a wider audience without the need for extensive and dedicated study which lacks the depth and clarity of the esoteric exoteric knowledge tends to be accepted without question and focuses on common beliefs and knowledge which is widely embraced as truth without due diligence into whether it is true or not, and the epistemic justifications of such knowledge or beliefs. Contrary, esoteric knowledge means inner, hidden, or secret. This knowledge is often considered hidden or secret, reserved for a select few who are initiated. It is typically not openly known and accessible to the general public. Esoteric teachings that delve into profound spiritual or philosophical concepts and truths that do require extensive and dedicated study, contemplation, or personal experience to fully understand. Esoteric knowledge frequently employs symbolism, metaphors, and allegories to convey deeper meanings and insight and inspire the student to question and critically think. Understanding goes beyond the literal interpretations and gets to the epistemic justification for such knowledge. Whenever we think of esoteric and exoteric, I like to think of a circle with a center point, which we will be getting deep into the circle dot symbolism in the future. The exoteric knowledge is the outer layer. It is literally the book cover, whereas the esoteric and the mystery traditions get very close to the center point. So all the world religions have a little bit of exoteric knowledge, whereas most people commonly understand, let's just say, Christianity at some basic level, but there's a deeper philosophical and allegorical nature to the religious ideologies and teachings. There is esoteric knowledge hidden within each religion that gets us closer to that center point of truth. The mystery traditions and mystery schools happen to be even closer to the truth than that. Our goal as spiritual warriors here is to attain the most accurate information about the truth as possible. There is nothing more romantic than understanding the mysteries of nature. And those who have come before us have dedicated more time than modern man into understanding the unseen forces that work in reality. This is why the esoteric knowledge is so crucial and why the occult is also a pinnacle of the model for storing this knowledge. But what is the occult? Well, the great Freemason, C.W. Leadbeater, gives us a profound statement on this question. He says, how shall we define occultism? The word is derived from the Latin occultus, which means hidden, so that it is the study of the hidden laws of nature. Since all the great laws of nature are in fact working in the invisible world far more than in the visible. Occultism involves the acceptance of a much wider view of nature than that which is ordinarily taken. The occultist, then, 
is a man who studies all the laws of nature that he can reach or of which he can hear. And as a result of his study, he identifies himself with these laws and devotes his life to the service of evolution. The great esotericist and author Manly P. Hall goes on to say, Occultism is the ancient science which deals with the hidden forces of nature, the laws governing them, and the means by which such forces can be brought under the control of the enlightened human mind. So in fact, occultism is a set of sciences which is not widely known to the general population, consisting of two bodies of hidden knowledge. What are these bodies? One is the minor or lesser arcana, which deals with the microcosmic or inner world. This is knowledge of the self, the human psyche, or consciousness, specifically monad consciousness, and how it operates. And to associate this, I am using the tarot card, the fool, which literally is the initiate. And we will be getting deep into the symbolism and allegory of the tarot in future episodes. The other is the major or greater arcana, which is the macrocosmic or outer world. This is knowledge of the laws of nature, the universal and spiritual laws, both seen physical laws and unseen spiritual and metaphysical laws. And to symbolically correlate this idea, the world card is being used from the tarot. As an initiate, we must understand that practicing the knowledge that we gain is of crucial importance. It is not just about gaining information because knowledge that is not turned into wisdom is stagnation. The practitioner of occultism is committed to the relentless pursuit of hidden knowledge, sciences, and metaphysical wisdom that transcends conventional comprehension. This involves the methodical examination and application of esoteric teachings, symbols, and rituals with the aim of uncovering profound insight into the concealed forces that influence both our individual lives and the broader cosmos. Occultism delves profoundly into the realms of all fields of study and is not limited to the stereotypical ideas of the occult. It encompasses the exploration of age-old wisdom, potential future sciences, ancient traditions, clandestine societies, universal laws, and on and on. Far from being merely an academic or theoretical endeavor, which does not mean that it does not incorporate academia or theoretical ideas, occultism represents a practical and transformative journey of self-discovery, spiritual advancement, and understanding the realm in which we operate in. Whenever we speak of the occult, most will probably have a specific Hollywood image ingrained in their mind. Usually, you'll get a negative response from people, especially with religious upbringings. They will think of people in the woods doing satanic rituals, sacrificing animals. And as we progress, we will see that occultism is not what most think it is. In the early stages of practicing occult, some of us think we are like Anton LaVey, especially in our youth. When I talk to my friends about what I'm doing, they think of it as fantasy, something akin to Harry Potter. When I talk to my family about the occult, they think of it as satanic worship and sacrifice. But what I'm really doing is studying, studying deeply, profoundly, and trying to understand myself better and understand the world in a much clearer fashion. This is the true art of the occultist, is constant contemplation and introspection and investigatory processes into the mysteries of the universe. At its essence, occultism endeavors to unveil the profound mysteries of existence, providing individuals with the tools to tap into their inner potential and forge connections with others and higher planes of consciousness. It promotes a holistic perspective that acknowledges the intricate interplay of all facets of reality. Through the practice of occultism, seekers are encouraged to explore the concealed dimensions of human nature, the cosmos, and the one great spirit, often referred to in the mystery schools as the grand architect of the universe. Ultimately, occultism represents a journey of personal growth, spiritual maturation, freedom, and enlightenment. 
it motivates individuals to transcend the limitations of the material world and strive for a deeper understanding of the metaphysical truths that underlie our existence. But occultism is not just merely an intellectual pursuit for knowledge. It is at the very root of the human nature. It is within the awe or the aspects of curiosity coming from the most basic instincts of the human mind. There is in fact an innate property of occultism intertwined with reality. The truth of the occult nature of the universe is that the reality has an inherent, hidden, or mysterious aspect to it that goes beyond what is commonly understood or visible. All physical scientific inquiries are endeavors to understand the invisible occult nature of the universe. Occultism posits that there are deeper layers of knowledge and truth that can be uncovered through the study of the hidden symbolic forms of nature. The universal language is symbolism, and through the study and correct understanding of this language, we can live in harmony with the occult laws of reality. Occultism incorporates the very basics of science, such as the scientific methodology. And every single child that has ever existed throughout all time has been a student of the occult by de facto. The psychologist Carl Jung, in his book Psychology and Alchemy, states this, The real mystery does not behave mysteriously or secretively. It speaks a secret language. It adumbrates itself by a varying of images which all indicate its true nature. I am not speaking of a secret personally guarded by someone with a content known to its possessor, but of a mystery, a matter or circumstance which is secret, known only through the vague hints, but essentially unknown. The real nature of the matter was unknown to the alchemist. He knew it only in hints. In seeking to explore it, he projected the unconscious into the darkness of matter in order to illuminate it. In order to explain the mystery of matter, he projected yet another mystery, his own psyche, his own psychic background, into what was to be explained. Obscurum per obscurius, ignotum per ignotius. This procedure was not, of course, intentional. It was an involuntary occurrence. Fundamentally, occultism is nothing more than a tool, and the level of consciousness of its wielder determines whether it is used malevolently or benevolently. It is true that occultism does incorporate a very dark side, and this is usually what is sensationalized by the media and by Hollywood, or by religious fanatics. Occultism is a double-edged blade. Occult sciences encompass knowledge that can be harnessed for both benevolent purposes such as enhancing human consciousness and morality, as well as malevolent intentions like manipulation, control, and the stifling or the constriction of consciousness. To distinguish between these contrasting applications of occult wisdom, the coined term light occultism or magic with a K and dark occultism or sorcery for the latter are adequate. Accordingly, those who practice light occultism, magic, may be referred to as light occultists, magicians, magi, light builders, or light workers, and there are many other names that you can give these individuals. On the other hand, practitioners of dark occultism, or sorcery, could be aptly labeled as dark occultists, sorcerers, dark builders, or dark workers, and many other labels that can be associated to them. But to truly understand this, we have to define what magic versus sorcery actually is. Magic, with the K, is the craft or art of influencing change to occur in accordance with the higher will. It is also very important to note the case-sensitive W in both of these wills. Sorcery is the craft or art of manipulating change to occur in accordance with one's selfish will. To define this a little bit further and refine this, it is always at the expense of others. Magic, however, is the craft and art of influencing change to occur in accordance with the higher will and is never at the expense of another. The case-sensitive word will is crucial to understand. 
or in the occult, the cryptic language of symbolism can define something so subtle to distinguish the differences between sorcery and magic. As we move further into the series, we will see this playing out quite frequently in the occult literature, especially when it comes to the alchemical text and grimoires of the ancient alchemist of the past and hermeticist. To put a finer point on light occultism and dark occultism, let's take a look at their applications. Light occultism is an educative model to preserve and protect the occult knowledge in order for that knowledge to be utilized and applied when the initiate is ready for the ascension and evolution of their consciousness. Light occultists have hidden occult knowledge in order to prevent its complete eradication during exceedingly draconian times. It is important to know that they are not withholding the knowledge to create a power differential. They understand that the knowledge comes with a heavy load of responsibility, such as treating it as sacred and sharing it wisely to help evolve humanity, otherwise it will be lost or remain hidden. It is associated with positive intentions, personal growth, spiritual development, healing, evolution, freedom, liberty, and self-improvement or self-actualization. Practitioners of light occultism adhere to the principles and the universal and objective laws of nature. They focus on agape, compassion, empathy, and helping others in times of need. Contrary, dark occultism is an inductive model intended to hide and conceal occult knowledge in order for them to create and maintain a power differential between those who have this knowledge and those who do not have such knowledge. It is used to ensure humanity's enslavement and to ensure that the dark occultists remain in power. Their work is always done in secrecy, constantly contravening the freedom and prosperity of all but themselves. It is associated with negative intentions and actions, harm, violence, coercion, manipulation, unnecessary chaos, and destructive goals. They enshrine the dogma of moral relativism, social Darwinism, selfishness, and eugenics. They use occult knowledge and practices for personal gain at the expense of others to achieve their agendas. And as we move forward again, we will start to see how dark occultists truly run this world, especially when it comes to geopolitics. In truth, the modern occultist or light occultist is really a de-occultist. What is a de-occultist, you may ask? It is an individual driven by a profound intuition and deep commitment to uncovering hidden knowledge about the self and the surrounding reality. They keenly observe both the external world and their inner realms. Through careful processing, they arrive at a genuine understanding of truth, which then they act upon, manifesting true wisdom. With their remarkable ability to swiftly and effectively distinguish reality from illusion, de fearlessly extend their advice, assistance, and support to those in need of such wisdom. Employing exceptional deductive and contemplation skills, they tirelessly strive to illuminate the deceptions, corruption, and falsehoods prevalent in the world. They are in service of truth and to truth and a higher purpose greater than themselves, or AKA the higher case will. The occultists leave no stone unturned in their relentless quest for truth, insistently seeking feasible solutions that can lead to real and positive change. Their unwavering dedication lies in upholding the values of truth, love, and freedom, positioning them as unwavering defenders of these ideas. The great philosopher and esotericist or occultist Manly P. Hall said, in the world of the occult, nothing remains hidden forever. All secrets will eventually be brought to the light. He was a de-occultist of his time, and probably one of the best, if not the best de-occultist of all times. When most people think of occultism or occultist, they think specifically of rituals. In the modern day, rituals have been demonized and marginalized by those who even practice rituals themselves, specifically religious zealots. For us to progress, let's etymologically define ritual. Ritualist in Latin means relating to religious rites, which is derived from ritus, 
which also means religious observance or ceremony, custom or usage. What does right etymologically mean? It means formal act or procedure specifically or non-specific to religious observance performed accordingly to an established manner or tradition. So rightus literally simply means custom or usage. Re in different context than to do over literally means to reason, count, on the notion of to count, to observe carefully. This makes sense when we start to look at what we are doing with rituals, which is a methodical repetition of performance or customs. So a ritual is a set of actions, often ceremonial in nature, performed in a prescribed order and typically imbued with symbolic meaning. These actions are usually repetitive and follow specific traditions, often passed down through generations. Rituals can be found in various aspects of human life, including religious ceremonies, cultural practices, social customs, and even personal routines. Joseph Campbell, who is a writer and a professor of literature at the Sarah Lawrence College, specifically worked in comparative mythology and comparative religion. He says, a ritual is an enactment of a myth. And by participating in the ritual, you are participating in the myth. And since myth is a projection of the depth wisdom of the psyche, by participating in the ritual, you are being, as it were, put in accord with that wisdom, which is the wisdom that is inherent within you anyhow. There are several reasons why rituals play a significant role in the occult. I have laid out eight symbolically and correlatively, which in the future, I will be revealing why the number eight is so crucial. The first is symbolic representation. Rituals often involve the use of symbols, gestures, and objects that carry deep esoteric and philosophical meanings. These symbols can serve as a bridge between the conscious and unconscious mind, helping individuals to tap into hidden aspects of their psyche and the universal consciousness. All eight of these can be used in negative ways. I'm specifically focusing on the positive application of these rituals. The second is focus and concentration. Performing rituals requires a high level of focus and concentration. This intense mental state can lead to altered states of consciousness, making it easier for practitioners to access higher levels of awareness, intuition, and insights. The third is psychological transformation. Rituals can be a profound tool for personal transformation. They allow individuals to enact symbolic actions that represent desired changes in their lives. By repeatedly performing these actions, individuals can reinforce positive behaviors and beliefs leading to personal growth and development. Energetic alignment is the fourth. Many occult rituals involve the manipulation of energy, whether it is through meditation, visualization, or specific movements such as dance and gesture. These rituals aim to align the practitioner's personal energy with the greater cosmic forces or spirit realms, creating a sense of harmony and attunement. The fifth is connection with deeper realities. Occult rituals are often designed to establish a connection with higher realms of consciousness or quote-unquote spiritual entities, which I would consider to just be archetypal versions of ourselves and divine forces, aka elemental powers. These rituals serve as a means of communication with these other dimensions, facilitating the acquisition of hidden knowledge and wisdom. It is important to note that whether you believe in spiritual entities or interdimensional entities, that at the fundamental level of consciousness, we are all connected. From my personal practices in the occult, I look at these forces or spiritual encounters as archetypes which are there to teach us a lesson and to bestow upon us great wisdom for the betterment of our own personal experience and evolution. The sixth is tradition and continuity. 
Rituals are an integral part of many occult traditions and secret societies. They help maintain a sense of continuity and shared experience among practitioners. Rituals passed down through generations can connect individuals to a lineage of wisdom and knowledge. So within these traditions, within these gestures, these movements, these dances, there is deep esoteric knowledge that is conveyed through form. The seventh is psychodrama. Rituals can be seen as a form of psychodrama, allowing practitioners to explore and work through psychological issues, fears, and desires in a controlled and symbolic manner. This can lead to personal healing and a deeper understanding of the self, taking on other psychological archetypes which can widen their own aspects of character and personality. This is a component to shadow work. The eighth is mystical experiences. For some practitioners, rituals can lead to profound mystical experiences, including a sense of oneness with the universe, encounters with these spiritual beings or archetypes, or moments of transcendence. These experiences can be deeply transformative and provide a sense of spiritual fulfillment. Mystical experiences, to me, is about occult revelations. It is about learning things from nature whether that nature is coming from within us or external of us. It's about gaining true wisdom and gaining information for us to process so that we can manifest what we say we want and create a better experience for ourselves and those around us. Mystical experiences are less mystical than what most people think of them as, but it is a romantic idea that drives people to be allured to such mystical ideas. Victor Turner, who was a cultural anthropologist, best known for his work on symbols, rituals, and rites of passage, says ritual is a window into the social soul, offering a view of the intimate connections between human beings and their world. Fertility rituals, in particular, illuminate the ways in which communities seek to harness the forces of nature for their survival and prosperity. We're going to see this repetitive connection to agriculture and fertility embedded within all rites of passage and rituals, specifically the alignment of our consciousness in order to gain aid from the forces of nature. Fertility rituals are one of the eldest and oldest forms of ritual practices. Anybody who has studied totemic sociology will understand how old fertility rituals really are. Dating back to the earliest totemic hero cults, fertility rituals are ceremonial practices that have been performed by various cultures throughout history to promote and celebrate fertility, both in agriculture and human reproduction and animal reproduction. These rituals are often deeply rooted in cultural and religious traditions and are intended to ensure the abundance of crops, livestock, and continuation of a community through childbirth. Here are some common elements and examples of fertility rituals. We have agricultural fertility, we have rain dances, we have maypole dancing, wedding rituals, and blood rituals. All of these rituals will use symbols and talismans to invoke certain meanings and potential spirits or abundance of their crops and their society. The two main symbols that we find throughout all cultures are the phallic symbol and the yonic symbol. In many cultures, the phallic symbols, such as statues or carvings, are used to represent male fertility and often placed in fields or homes for protection and abundance. This is also the same for the yonic symbol, which is the symbol of the female reproductive organs and processes. In ancient Rome, there is the Lupercalia festival, which is held on February 15th. Rooted in both pastoral and fertility rites, it honored Lupercus, the Roman god of shepherds, and Lupa, the she-wolf, who according to legend, nursed Romulus and Remus, the founders of Rome. Initially, Lupercalia was a pastoral festival aimed at purifying the city and promoting health and fertility. Over time, it became strongly associated with mainly fertility, aimed at ensuring fertility of fields, livestock, and people. The festival was overseen by a group of priests called Luperci. The priests were typically young men of noble birth. 
There was also sacrifices that took place with this ritual, usually goat sacrifices and dog sacrifices. The goat is a specific astrotheological symbol, which we will be covering in the future. But to simplify, represents higher states of consciousness. The Luprakai would then smear the goat's or dog's blood on their foreheads and wipe it off with milk-soaked wool. They wore loincloths made from the skins of the sacrificed goats. We often find this in various Hollywood films as well, the blood and the milk. The ceremonies were centered around the Lupercal Cave, believed to be where the she-wolf nursed Romulus and Remus back to health. One of the other parts of this ritual, and maybe the most notable aspect of Lupercalia, was the whipping and running. The Luperci would run along the Palatine Hill, striking people with strips of goat hide. This was believed to promote fertility, and women who were struck were thought to be blessed with fertility and an easier childbirth. This ritual is filled with esoteric symbolism, which as we progress through the occult series, we will be able to unveil more about these rites and rituals and their esoteric meaning. Another great ritual to look at, which is an extremely powerful and esoteric ritual, is the Maypole dance ritual. The dance around the Maypole is symbolic in nature, of course. The significance of the maypole dance is to celebrate or encourage fertility. Yet again, the tree or pole can be considered to be the phallic or masculine symbol. The flower and the ribbons can be considered beautiful and a feminine symbol. This ancient symbolism of the maypole is further based upon the reference of the axis mundi, the point around which the universe is said to revolve. The atis pine, or the tree the maypole was constructed from, was stripped of foliage to symbolize change hence being transformed into the pole. It becomes the central access point of the celebration. And this will be a common theme that we see throughout the occult, is the circle dot invocation and use. And we will be covering the circle dot in episode two in extreme clarity. The pole has further phallic connotations as it is a masculine symbol in combination with the discus or the circle, the outer rim which binds the things together. That represents the feminine reproductive process. There is deep symbolism in the Maypole ritual, which should be studied in full. Things like the numerological significance of the seven ribbons to represent the colors of the rainbow, or deeper, the seven chakra systems, or the seven hermetic principles, the seven circumpolar stars. The Maypole also symbolizes the number 10, with the pole being the central point, or the one, and the discus along with the circle dance around it representing the zero. And going back to the earlier slide about the major and minor arcana, the full card is the zero and invokes the symbolism of the maypole through the aesthetic attire that the fool is wearing. In Rome, every three years, there was a celebration of the May Festival called the Maeuma, Festival. This was a month-long nocturnal dramatic festival, also given a name Orgies, which celebrated the mysteries of Dionysus and Aphrodite. Dionysus being the god of grape harvest, winemaking, and fertility, orchards and fruit, vegetation, insanity, ritual madness, religious ecstasy, festivity, and theater. And Aphrodite, the goddess of love, beauty, pleasure, passion, and procreation. Another common ritual that takes place during this time period, which is the mid-Sabbath, is called Beltane or Valpurgis Knot. In the Gaelic traditions, Beltane means bright fire or lucky fire. It also means first of summer, as it marked the beginning of the summer season. This was the time when cattle were driven out 
to the summer pastors, and many Gaelic Celts were primarily herdsmen. Rituals were performed during this festival to protect the cattle, crops, and people, and to encourage growth. This ritual starts on the eve of April 30th. Special bonfires and dances around these bonfires were held during this time period. It is said that people would walk around or between the bonfires to absorb the fire's protective powers and other rituals like leaping over the flames and embers were enacted for luck. And in many cases, the animals would also be driven through the smoke of the fire or made to jump over the fires as well, as though this was thought to help protect their milk from being stolen by evil, quote-unquote, fairies. Many doors, windows, and briars, and livestock would be decorated with yellow mayflowers as they invoke, symbolically, the fire protective element. And just like the maypole ritual, we find may bushes with bright flowers, ribbons, and shells, usually, and in many cases, crowns of thorn. Holy wells were also visited, and Beltane dew was collected as it was thought to bring beauty and maintain youthfulness. And in many cases, the embers from the Beltane fires would be taken home to light fires in their own homes for further measure of protective luck. Sir James George Fraser, an expert on comparative mythology and religion who wrote The Golden Bough, states rituals are a means by which societies attempt to influence and harmonize with the natural world. Through these practices, early humans sought to control the unpredictable elements of nature and ensure continued fertility of the land and prosperity of their communities. All of these rituals have deep esoteric significance including astrotheology, mythology, eschatology, and specifically spiritual evolution. In all totemic societies, even in the modern era, we have rites of passage, which is the most prominent and ubiquitous ritual of all. All cultures have rites of passage specifically relating to fertility, such as puberty ceremonies where young people are initiated into adulthood and responsibilities of procreation. Rites of passage have three phases, separation, liminality, and incorporation. As Von Ginnep described, I propose to call the rites of separation from the previous world preliminal rites. Those executed during transitional stage, liminal or threshold rites, and ceremonies of incorporation into the new world post-liminal rites. By examining a range of cultures from ancient Egypt to the Inuit, the significance and variation of these ceremonies underscore the universal importance in the evolution of the mythos and the perfected sciences of the mystery traditions. Thus, we can come to a more clear understanding of this process. One rite of passage was done by the Hamir, or Hammer, which has deep significance symbolically that we will explain later. This ritual is performed by jumping over the bulls, and as we can see, there is a ubiquitous nature of this symbol of cattle and bulls being correlated throughout a lot of these rituals. This specifically has to do with astrotheological and celestial phenomenon that dates back to early totemic societies. Rites of passage are all about the hero's journey and the evolution of the self in harmony with cycles of nature. It is preserved in the zodiac or zodiac model of the seasons and many other celestial phenomenons witnessed in nature. This bowl jumping initiation, or the hamir, or the hammer, is specifically in correlation with the, the zodiac sign of Taurus, or the sun, the representation of the hero, and his journey upward to adulthood has to jump over the Taurus to reach its pinnacle and apex in the year. It's summer fire. Mary Louise von Franz, the student of Carl Jung, says initiations, rites of passage, are a symbolic death and rebirth, wherein the old self is shed and a new self is born, often linked with the learning of essential truths about life and one's place in the world. There are many types of rites of passage. For the Aboriginal Australian, there is the walkabout, which is a profound journey for young Aboriginal males marking their transition into adulthood, also correlating to the astrotheological hero's journey. The term walkabout has been misunderstood and misappropriated in popular culture, sometimes being used as a pejorative to suggest aimlessly wandering in the wilderness. 
In reality, it is a deep, meaningful spiritual practice with specific cultural and educative purposes for the initiate. As another example, funerary rites, specifically practiced in Egypt, are extremely significant, which we are going to be exploring deeply in the later episodes of this series. In ancient Egypt, elaborate funerary practices were developed to ensure deceased safe passage to the afterlife and through the afterlife into reincarnation. This included mummification, a process aimed at preserving the body for eternity, which is in conjunction with the advancements of eschatology. Many different forms of tombstones, which are considered to be monumental gateways to the afterlife, and this includes tombs, were used in funerary rites. The Egyptians also believed in the necessity of providing the deceased with items, which is considered to be magic by anthropologists, that they might need in the next world or to help them through their journey through the duat. This included the inclusion of food, jewelry, and even servants crafted from clay or stone within the burial chambers and burial grounds. The ancient Egyptians would bury their dead on the west side of the Nile Valley to symbolize the hero's journey into the underworld. Ancient funerary rites are among the oldest and most significant practices in human history, reflecting a profound respect for the dead and a belief in an afterlife or a reincarnative principle. The earliest known evidence of such rituals date back to the Middle Paleolithic period, roughly 100,000 years ago, and as we explore, we will see that these rituals date back at least 600,000 years at minimum to early hero cult totemic societies. Marcia Iliadi was a Romanian historian of religion, a fiction writer, a philosopher, and a professor at the University of Chicago. He says the participation in the rite implies emerging from the ordinary time and reintegration into the mythical time, in the great time. The sacred time periodically reactualized in festivals gives the participants the illusion of behaving in a mythical epoch in ilio tempore. So as we can see, rites of passages and occult rituals have been evolving since time immemorial. We do rituals every day with our repetitive behaviors. And it is up to us as the carriers of this esoteric wisdom to refine our processes of ritual practice and to ensure that our progeny understands the importance of these ancient esoteric teachings. Throughout the ages, the mysteries of the occult and the power of ritual has fascinated and intrigued humanity. From ancient rites of passages to the esoteric practices of secret societies, which we will be exploring in depth, these traditions have woven a complex tapestry of spirituality throughout all ages. In this episode, we have taken a look at some of the hidden realms of ancient totemic rites and rituals and what the occult actually is. As we close this episode, remember that the mysteries of the occult are not just relics of the past. They live on with us every single day. It is only for us as the conscious observer to become aware that we are practitioners of the occult. It is our number one purpose and goal to understand the occult nature of the universe and ourselves. In many ways, the rituals we have explored remind us of our shared humanity, our fears and our hopes and our endless curiosity. Whether we seek to commune with the divine, harness unseen forces of nature, or simply understand ourselves better, these practices connect us to something greater than what is commonly thought of as a ritual. Thank you for joining me today on this journey into the heart of the occult and the soul of ritual. Until we meet again for episode two, may the mysteries you seek bring you wisdom and wonder. And remember, you are not just an observer, but a participator here in this co-created reality. We have a responsibility to the occult sciences, and it is up to us to be the change that we want to see in this world. Stay curious, stay enlightened, and may your path ever be illuminated. In the next episode, we will be exploring the universal language of symbolism, getting deep into semiotics, archetypes, the magic circle or the circle dot, metaforms or pure forms. So make sure not to miss out on the next episode of Beyond the Forbidden Veil.